Welcome to the podcast, A Drink with Derek. Follow comedian Derek Richards on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel and watch all episodes of the podcast. Now grab a drink and join your host, Derek Richards. Asked, they find out your name. Oh, how do you like to be addressed? You prefer Native American or First Nations, American Indian? I'm like, I kind of like original landowner. <laughs> do we have any other original landowners here tonight? Anyone else ready to party like it's 1491? No? <laughs> okay, the rest of you are getting very sleepy, very sleepy. <laughs> After the show, you will give back all of the land. <laughs> And you will stop casting Lou Diamond Phillips as an Indian <laughs> in your cowboy movies. <laughs> I am not from the reservation. I come from a small fishing village on the Pacific coast called uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> Born in LA at birth, at birth I weighed 11 pounds, five ounces. <laughs> Worst part was 11 pound head, five ounce body. <laughs> I was a globe on a Q-tip. <laughs> All my baby pictures, I'm like. <laughs> but my mom actually had an easy delivery because I'm adopted. <laughs> my, friends, my friends like, were you delivered by C-section? Uh, no court order. <laughs> Navajo adopted by a Mexican mother and a Jewish father. Yeah. I'm a bargain hunter gatherer. <laughs> illegal too, I'm illegal too, Pro, because you no longer adopt an Indian child from their tribe. That is called the Indian Child Welfare Act. And they, they pass that law to protect our people from Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Hey, it's A Drink With Derek. That, who you just saw on the comedy clip, is my guest, uh, Mark Yaffe, who is up in uh, Reno, Nevada right now. I am uh, here in Las Vegas. Mark is uh, has a special on uh, Showtime called uh, Going Native, which you can actually still get on Amazon Prime. He also has a, a special, very, very proud of this for you, and I know you're proud of it as well. Your Dry Bar special, Mid Laugh Crisis, is on the uh, Dry Bar platform and got uh, over 2 million Facebook views in his first uh, eight days after release. That is uh, very commendable. Congratulations. He also has a podcast called uh, How Does That Happen? Uh, you've seen him on Comics Unleashed, uh, PBS, the Latino Laugh Festival. He is here now. Mark Yaffe from Reno, Nevada. Not from Reno. You live in Reno now. From California. In Reno. Original, original California, now uh, Nevada. You know, So um, technically, I'm in uh, Sparks, Nevada, a very exclusive suburb of uh, Reno. So... Yeah, you know, you know you're exclusive when you live in a city named after a dragging muffler. <laughs> it's, a, it's it's a gated community. There's actually just a uh, just a just a gate propped up on the on the tree outside the entrance to your yeah, uh, to your development. Our, our HOA uh, is tasked with picking up shell casings. That's <laughs> that's Reno. That's I true. Love it. Well, people, I love it. And you said you know yeah, I'm from Vegas. Marks in Reno. Every time I, like, if I work in Vegas or if I'm on the road, oh, or where you, you're from Reno? Oh, yeah, I've been to Vegas. It's like, yeah, except for the seven-hour, 400-mile drive and practically the Twin Cities. That is the, that is hands down the worst drive. I know, I know you've made it a million times. I've done it once, and I'm like, never again. That is a horrific drive. People go, oh, well, it's in the same state. I'm like, you have no idea that two-lane road that takes you from Vegas to Reno and there is a stretch there where there is zero cell phone coverage and you will not see a car. I went up there. The first time I went up there, I literally, I don't know why I glanced at my clock when a car passed by. The next car that passed me, I looked at the time. It was literally about 40 minutes. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you people really, you go for 100 miles at that gas station. And then, oh. the, yeah, much, much less cell phone coverage. So you really, you really you're deep shit if something goes wrong out there. And, you know, and the towns aren't the aren't the friendliest you get to like Tonopah and Beatty. They just, they just look like some sort of uh, uh, witness protection for uh, some, some 
I don't know. Do it on people. <laughs> it just well, it looks like stuff you see in the movies. It's literally like right out of a out of a Stephen King. Yeah. Film. Some of those, some of those towns. I just start having premonitions. I think, yeah, I was just like, oh. <laughs> well, good to see you, man. Always uh it's been a while since we've had a chance to actually connect in uh in person, but uh you're uh having a drink with uh with uh, Derek, I've had a drink with Mark Yaffe before. I've no, never seen you. You know what's funny? Correct. I feel bad. I'm not drinking, but I, I look like I've been drinking. So I think that still counts. Okay. I'm just having a cup of coffee out of my uh, coffee mug in honor of you, which is right over in uh, Reno. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great little, uh, great little diner, restaurant, hangout place. You have. Uh, before we go any further, I want to do a thing called. Um, you are uh, your Native American, and I want to test your Native Americanness. That should go pretty bad, poorly, yeah. Because you know, I, wasn't gonna... raised, I wasn't raised in the culture. I'm I'm actually originally from a small fishing village on the Pacific Coast of Los Angeles. So, uh, really, okay. I found, out, I found out I was native when I was 25. I was I was adopted uh, by a Mexican mother, Jewish father. So I'm a, a Navajo adopted by a Mexican mother, Jewish father. Oregon hunter gatherer. Technical. Yeah. Wow, that's a uh, wait a minute. So you're 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 Navajo adopted by a Mexican mother and a Jewish father. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, let's see how these questions go. Uh, have <laughs> team featured in the uh, movie Major League? Oh, the uh, the uh, um, Red Men of uh, Lake Erie you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Cleveland Indians. There we go. Okay, here we go. Super Bowl winning team from 1983, 88, and 92. 83, 88, 92. Okay. Reside in the state, reside in the capital. Oh, that would be the Washington football team, uh, formerly known as the uh, the Washington Rednecks. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, your uh, your last question to test your Indianness, your Native Americanness. Okay. NHL, NHL team from Chicago. Oh, the, the uh, none other than the Blackhawks, of course. There we go. See, well, you passed. See, look how easy that was. Yeah. <laughs> I was worried. I thought you were going to start asking me some language questions. You know, my favorite warrior chief. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Favorite reservation. No, no, no. Gallup or something. Yeah, good. Well, now you, I was looking at your bio. You have on here that you entertained people on an Alaska Airlines flight. Yeah, I always like to tell people, I think I may be one of the few comics with Airland C credits. So the air was Alaska Airlines on the way to Fairbanks to perform at the World Eskimo Indian Olympics. Yes, the word Eskimo is still used, uh, America. So at least for the old Eskimo Olympic, Eskimo Indian Olympics in Fairbanks. So um, we were, they're super chill. You've flown Alaska. So my, I just, right. I was, my buddy Gilbert, I said, hey, we should see if uh, the let us uh, mention our show. Because, you know, like, let's try to get some people out there. What the hell? Because they were just super casual. And he went up there and he says, oh, yeah, she wants you to go. Uh, uh, she wants you to say something. She's sort of the headliner or something like that. I don't know. He, somehow he finagled me. And she literally hands me the little PA thing. He says, oh, yeah, but God, your friend Gilbert said you tell some jokes for the passengers. So, oh, you know, no. Yeah, you can't punk out at that point. You know what I mean? So No, where are you going to go? You're going to hide yeah. in the bathroom? Go hide over by the drink tray. You know, that was one option, but. So you yeah. actually had to, so you actually yeah. went ahead and did uh, and did some material for the people because yeah. normally because I, for me like when I fly and I know and, and you fly quite a bit as well but I mean when you're on a Southwest flight the flight attendants always think it it turns into an open mic I mean they just literally try to be the funny guy the funny chick whatever and it is the most annoying thing in the world so were these people cool or do they want to kill you by the time the plane landed you know I think there were three or four people who really enjoyed it it was it was a bit polite indifference what I would say would be the uh, the best, you know. I heard some good laughs, and then I heard some just kind of like, you said, kind of got some weird stares, and they weren't sure where it was coming from. And you know, people, you know, people fly; they just want to be left alone, you know. So at one point, I just felt like I was invading their privacy. But yeah, yeah, I see. Like I remember years ago, they had flight attendants. Let's put it that way. Though. <laughs> well, I remember years ago they had comedians on flights. It was a long, long time ago. I mean, it was, I mean, not all of them, but there were, there were a few comics that were doing airline comedy. And I would just, I'm thinking to myself, I would just absolutely kill you. That was like a scheduled thing. 
Yeah, it wasn't like an impromptu thing like where you got up and did that. I mean, they literally had, there's some old school comics that can tell you stories about doing comedy on a flight. And I would just, yeah, and it wasn't booked as a comedy flight. Mm. It was just a flight and it just it just happened. So, yeah, a pop up, if you will. Uh, yeah, that doesn't, you can't surprise people with, uh, with comedy. Mm-mm. Now, coming from your, uh, first, I want to talk about your dry bar special. Um, it, called mid laugh crisis, which is hilarious. You shot it. Uh, it was a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And you did the longer version of it. If I'm not, if uh, I'm correct, right. You did the 45 minute set. Yeah. We shot like 43, 45 minutes. I think I got edited down to like 38. Now they're at, I think 30 and they're probably going down to cutting them down to 25 when they're all polished up and trimmed, you know, like a, like a, like a hairstyle. Yeah, I should, well, I shot one that was 25 minutes long, which was just a couple of months ago. Oh, and so, so, yeah, they dialed it back quite a bit because they just ran out of people that could do, you know, 45 minutes clean. Now, and, and when I say clean, I mean, this is really clean. As somebody who shot this special, from your perspective, um, you know, they talk about there's cruise ship clean, clean. Comedy Club clean and then Provo, Utah clean because they shoot these things in Provo, Utah. Yeah. Now, were were you scared at all knowing these dry bar cleanliness restrictions when you went in to record? I think I thought about it long enough. I kind of, and, and talked to enough people that I was like, you know what, it should be fine. They're like they're just super, they're super chill, even though it's you know super conservative LDS audience and you know, 98% Mormon, it was, I was, I was, I had my you know reservations. I was more concerned about, I had to change a lot of product references and a Walmart and that stuff. I'm like, well, if this thing does really well, I don't want to get sued and lose the $7,200 I might earn over my lifetime royalties, you know? So I think that was more of the, the concern. And then I don't know if they had you watch the, uh, was it the, not the, was it the good, not the good neighbors, like the good morals clause, like they had a little cartoon as an, I had to watch an animated cartoon about, what, what? what dry bar dry bar uh or vid angel which are the owners of dry bar now it's split off what right. they what they expect expectations and you know and like oh we, we like to have clean it was like this little cartoon character and I, that was that was a little uneasy you know because in comedy we're so used to you know this is the you know, bastion of free speech speak your mind people want to hear what you know they can't say and now we have to hear what uh we have to say what they can't say. You know, you know, well, they showed us a video. They had put together a video called Provo Clean. And it was literally, they just wanted you. I mean, they were showing different clips. They're saying, okay, this is acceptable. This would not be acceptable. And one of the things that really got me was, I mean, if you mentioned God or Jesus and you weren't talking about God or Jesus, if you just said, you know, I went outside and, uh, you know, all four tires of my car were, you know, were flat and you went, ah, Jesus. They just, they literally view that as flat out profanity. Yeah. You might as well drop the string of F-bombs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was, it, it was a little bit, uh, it took some adjustment, but, uh, you know, I was only doing a 25 minute set. So that was, you know, I was fine. Yeah. Just tighten, just crank it in and tighten it. Yeah. But I did a, I did a, you know, a, I did a Mormon joke pretty early out of the gates. I flew into Salt Lake. I didn't realize how Mormon the state of Utah was till I got on the freeway carpool lane, seven or more passengers. <laughs> After that, I thought, okay, I think I'll be all right. Yeah. You know? Well, now you're not a stranger to shooting specials because you shot your special going native that was on Showtime. And yeah. now it's available on Amazon Prime. So you can pull it up on Prime. Yes. What, uh, how did that special come about? Well, our mutual friend Rick D'Elia was uh, uh, working with uh, some producers that uh, were affiliated with Showtime, Scott Montoya and Neil Marshall. And uh, we'd, we'd gone overseas to some armed forces entertainment tours. And he was talking about, oh, yeah, you're doing this tour with these native comics. And, yeah, they're looking for uh, they're looking for some theme specials. And I'm like, well, hey, pitch this to him. And he, and he did. And then, like, nothing happened for maybe one or two years. And then they they got back and we said, hey, we want you to uh, uh, be on. A, we're, we're doing a Showtime special. We're doing an all-native special. I mean, that sounds great. He goes, uh, except uh, we... I was touring with three other guys and we just want to use you along with Charlie Hill and Larry Omaha. So it's like, yeah, we right now we don't want to bring everyone else on board. I'm like, okay. So where of course it happens that weekend we're doing a show. So I tell those guys, like, oh man, you got to go to bat for us. We're it's all for one, one for all. So I ended up telling them, Hey, I, I'd like to do it, but can we, you know, I'd, I'd like to pass if we can't get these guys on. It was kind of a package deal. And 
So I had to wait like three or four days and they actually came back and said, yeah, we'll put everybody on. So and that's real cool. It was. So, it now, was. so now the thing you were doing, the powwow comedy jam, this was, you were doing that bef- and then that led into the going that native. Stuff. The, yeah. And then okay. uh, uh, Rick, Rick had uh, kind of kept updating me on the, you know, or updating them that, Hey, these guys are still doing this. And, you know, Native so at that time, that's 2010. You know, ethnic comedy tours are huge, and you know, right? Yams, you know, now it's, it seems like a it seems like forever ago, but uh, yeah, first all native special. And they uh, put a call out for audience members and they had zero response, so they're, they're like, they were all freaked out, no one was going to show up. But uh, Charlie Hills is, was the first native ever to be on uh, Carson Letterman, uh, Lake Charlie Hill. Uh, he had a radio show in LA on and on one of the uh, public radio special so he put out the word and we showed up the line was like literally around the block they turned people away so the show was sold out so you know it, it ended up being a, a really great experience and then uh like all things a couple of guys went and tried to do their own own tours and it kind of undermined what the producer wanted to do because he did the uh, three amigos scott mccoy with you know uh carlos mencia george lopez paul rodriguez which had some Good success. They did some right. You know, it was an amphitheater, so I think he had that in mind for us. And then he tried to book us at a casino, and one of the other guys had gone in there and tried to pitch his own show and undercut the whole thing. It's like, oh, Ooh. You know. so this was one of the guys that was on the Going Native special and Powell Comedy Jam and Powell Comedy Jam went uh, behind uh, your back and uh, did. Oh wow, okay, yeah, yeah. that's how did now? How, let me ask you something. How did you handle that? Well, I, th- I think we just kind of st- just ended up splitting up. So, you know, this is going to work. And we, we just moved on, went our separate ways. And with the nice- I mean, you're so chill. You're so you're so <laughs> level-headed. I mean, I would have lost my mind. Oh, I was pissed at the time. That's that's not even the, the backstory is the, the one, one uh, comic. He went and got, uh, after the Showtime things, like, this is all for one, one for all. I risk not getting on the show. And then he goes out and does a deal with the casino, he made like 25, 30,000 to shoot, to shoot his own special. Did he include us? No. So then I, that's when I was pissed. It was the beginning of the end. Ooh. But the nice thing is I, uh, I sold him the rights to this. We came up with the chiefs of comedy and I sold him the rights to chiefs of comedy. So I got I made $6,000. I'm like, yeah, okay. I got, I got some money out of it. I'm move on. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many native American comedians are out there right now? Because I, you don't see, I mean, I don't see a ton of them now. Granted, I could, you know, I don't know if there was a special or a different circuit for that uh, that that caters to that segment. But I mean, how many? I mean, I know Larry Omaha because I've worked with him before. Funny, funny guy. Um, the other guys that were on your tour. I mean, were there? Is there a big scene of Native American comedians? You know, it is growing. I mean, when I started uh, with the Powell Comedy Jam, we had there was maybe half a dozen, a dozen comedians probably maybe full-time and now i don't know how much more there is more than that there are some native scenes you go to some some communities and there's guys doing it there's uh uh what's his name larry charles did a netflix special a comedy comedy in dangerous places i think it was or comedy something about comedy around the world and they did a thing about uh, uh they went up to red lake and interviewed a few comedians up there three comics so there are some scenes you know it was kind of segmented you'd have like the mainstream comedians like myself larry uh, Charlie Hill, uh, Von Eagle Bear. Then you'd have like we call them like the Frybird comedians. It just kind of did the the reservation circuit and the you know tribal events. And and now it's kind of morphed. Now there's an urban scene. Uh, uh, there's there's a few comedians that are, are Hollywood uh, is starting to you know catch on. The Rutherford Falls of Ed Helms. They've hired like five native writers for that show, and it includes a, a couple of you know uh, prominent cast members that are native in a sitcom, which is good. So it's. It's it's slowly bleeding into mainstream, but there's only people forget natives are only one percent of the population. So if you're talking about three three million out of three hundred country three hundred thirty million. It's not a huge demographic that's you know they're going to sit clamor for for uh, material and content because there's just not a huge audience to sell it to. Now, what's the uh, how can I put this? What's the hackiest Native American comedian topics? I mean, obviously, you get Irish comics, and and they're, you get you get they're they're going to joke about you know we joke about drinking and and bad food. I mean, you have uh, obese comedians that do jokes about being obese, and you're like, yeah, okay, here's this, you know, here's here's the same you know tried 
you know, trotted out topic again. Is there are there any are there any jokes that Native American comedians do where you're where you're in the back going, oh geez, come on, really? That's so happy. Another one of those. Yeah. You know, I think it's in the delivery of you know, bad, bad casino jokes, bad drinking jokes. I think I think any joke that's done well, like you know, when I got to watch your special, the Irish comedy tour. You t- we can take stereotypes and make them funny and put a twist on them. That's to me, the, the 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 topic's not hack. It's the delivery is hack. You know, obviously there's stuff that's been overdone. You know, like you know, people would say, well, yeah, Mark, that's not true. Airline food and certain topics that have been overdone. Yeah, uh, natives drinking overdone. Probably diabetes uh maybe overdone people you know make fun about the they kind of sexualize the antis there's a lot of anti jokes and in indian humor they about the ants for some reason you know it's just the, so with the uh, ants with ants yeah like yeah like first the, the ant is kind of like the, the the you know like we have the crazy uncle maybe mm-hmm. in native culture and in, 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 in native culture is more the anti you know the crazy anti so that maybe that's been overdone, but you know, it's, I think there's limited, when you have a limited topic base, you know I mean? There's just everything we're talking about. Everyone is like, what do we have? 12 right. main topics with an ethnic spin or a cultural spin or, you know, I, to, to me, if, if you, if you can be funny and like I said, put an original spin on it, I'm like, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You know. Now you said you were, you were adopted. How old were you when you were adopted? Were you a baby? Yeah. Yeah. I was okay. About, yeah. 15 minutes old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. I was, I was adopted also when I was a baby. So it's, so it's a, uh, yeah. So, so you, you popped out 15 minutes later. I mean, it literally took your birth mom that long to hold you up and go, nah, this ain't going to work. Yeah. That's all she got. Which, you know, teen mother. And <laughs> she already signed over the papers. So it's like, it's a done deal. Now it's like an open adoption and the family's bond. And, you know, now back then it was like done, you know, lock up. Lock up the, uh, the, the the records. We find out nothing, and then she found me in the '80s. This is like pre, you know, pre widespread computers. She actually talked to one of the uh, uh, technicians or, or workers at the County LA of LA Adoptions to, to give her a birth certificate, which she wasn't supposed to have access to. She was that persuasive, and then she found an, uh, one of her cop friends was able to track me down my parents' house, and then she she found me when I was eighteen, but she was waiting until I was twenty five because she didn't want to kind of be disrupted with the you know the family dynamic, which was right. Yeah, how did that work out? Oh yeah, pretty good. You know, she she was uh, uh, we we're, we saw each other probably two or three times a year, and she uh, actually passed away about uh, two years ago. She got murdered. It was just crazy story there. Yeah. She, was taking care of someone and uh, the son like kind of whacked out and killed her. It's like, you know, it's just kind wow. of, she was, she was a caregiver, but yeah, she was a great lady. And then I'm, her, my, her I, son, her son whacked out and killed her. No, that uh, she was a caregiver for a family. And oh, oh, okay. Cause I was going to say, technically that's your brother. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, that, yeah. and my Navajo side is my, is my dad. He's been in and out of prison. So I haven't tracked him down. We're not even sure he's alive. I had some, you know, uh, online detective guy tried to do some some legwork and uh, he lived literally. This is crazy. My my birth father was living like a mile or two from where I lived in Reno, for, like back in 2015. He was like living in a boarding house or something. And I found I talked to the lady. Wow. Yeah. So I'll probably walked by the guy in the street. You know who knows. You know. That's insane. Yeah. Now, did you end up when you grew up in this? Uh, I mean, obviously, did your parents tell you that you were? who you were, or did they just kind of say, this is, did they just kind of leave it alone? No, you know, it's interesting. They never, I, I always knew I was adopted, but now my mom in her old age, is, she doesn't want anyone to know. Just because they live in a senior community and I've done a couple shows for them. Like, oh, you know what, if, if anyone asks, just don't, 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 you don't have to mention the adoption thing. I said, mom, you're five foot two inch Mexican woman. My dad's five foot nine, bald Jewish guy and me. The only way they're gonna know I'm not adopted is if they're blind. Right? <laughs> What uh, what myths are out there surrounding the Native American culture? As a you know, as a dumb white guy, explain to me some of the things that uh, that are myths about the Native American people. That when if a dumb white guy like me says it to you, you go, that, "No, that's not true." Well, people still ask if Indians still live, living in teepees. That's not an uncommon one. People still people think Indians are all getting rich on casinos, which isn't true. I my local casino money. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think the casino thing that everyone cashed in and now everything's fine and that's erased, you know, 
500 years of, of genocide and, and oppression and broken treaties, you know, and I think those are the, the two main ones probably. Yeah. So now, but isn't, is it like you need to live on the reservation in order to get money from the casino on that? Or is it just like any, like any member of the Cherokee tribe will get residuals from a Cherokee owned casino? Yeah. Is that true? Residual, it's an enrollment based. So if you live, on or off reservation, if you're an enrolled member, then you're entitled to uh, to uh, what they call it's like most reservations per capita per cap they call it. So, oh, okay. So, so you can't go that, into you think of urban casinos. You go to Minnesota, right outside the Minnetonkin Sioux, multimillionaires because you know it's location location. Pachanga, you know, you go right. down, I played there. Very, the tribe does very well. Fewer members, and they're they're an urban area, and they've done quite successful, but. We've been to casinos out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and and they're almost, you know, one step above a gas station is probably as far as the income stream for the tribe. You know, so. I think I've done those gigs too. I think we've all done those gigs. Yeah, some of those, some of those casinos that are in, someone sees a casino on your website, they're like, oh, well, that's cool. I'm like, you have no idea where this casino is at. I've done shows in the middle of Iowa, South Dakota, and like you said, they're literally it's it's all but a a convenience store off the side of the road. And there's a tiny little showroom there, and you don't know what you're going to get when you walk in. Yep, you're driving in the woods, and you get there, and then all of a sudden, it's just, where does this thing just pop out out of nowhere? And I like I like the challenge of that, though. That's the one thing about Indian country because I've done you know anything from doing a comedy on a rock after a tribal uh, a prayer, you know, like an elder gave a prayer, and then literally on, a, on the side of the mount, on a mountain in the Sierras, I've had to do. Uh, gymnasiums you're standing on the back you get there and, and you know it's a, it could be a decent paying gig so you think oh it's going to be great you know they're paying me you know uh four figures i'm going to be you know it's going to be high it's like we're in a gym i'm performing in front of the the quit smoking uh table and the and the uh, mother's breastfeeding awareness uh stand you know and so you just don't know what to expect and sometimes there's kids running around and it, that's what i love about it, indian gigs because you know the tribe can be super formal and super casual and the budget doesn't give it away. So, you know, we just, you know, I mean, usually we have a little hint. Okay, we know we're doing a $300 bar gig in, in uh, Bozeman, Montana, but I'm, I'm, you know, we'll send you, hey, we're going to fly you here. And then, like, oh, this is going to be high end. And, like, you get there, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm performing in, in, uh, across from a railroad track on a softball field, <laughs> which has happened before, too. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, there is literally no rhyme or reason as to the money that's being paid out from some of these casinos versus the actual gig itself. Yeah, you can get you can make really good money and be in front of maybe ten people, and they Dude, just they're like whatever. Yeah. I did a show one time in uh, uh, White Earth Casino, and Terry Fader is going to be there the next night. They had us where was a monthly Native comedy stories on the right. Thursday. So they had the showroom set up for Terry Fader, so I got to perform for. Uh, uh, 1,933 empty seats in the 2,000 seat showroom. <laughs> oh, God. And then, of course, he was probably sold out the next night. Oh, yeah. You know. Of course. Mark who? Yeah, Terry Fader. Yeah, we'll have I, we'll have fun tickets. Yeah. God. What, now, are you, let me ask you this. Are you offended by team mascots? In light um, of all the stuff going on in terms of the, what's team, that? I think the red skin was, was a little bit much. I mean, the the Chiefs, I'm, I'm okay with the Chiefs. I think Indians, you know, I, I'm i not a big fan of the name. You know what I mean? It's, I'm not like, oh, my God, this is, you know, I can't say I'm a, I'm a huge uh, standard bearer of protest. But I think, you know, if if my thing is if we're going to honor Native Americans, we're going to honor some other other uh, uh, fighters, too. There's no Cleveland Kamikazes. You know, there's no Boston Blitzkrieg. You know, there's <laughs> we're not the only ones that fought honorably, you know, right? Yes, the Cleveland Kamikazes. Yeah, that's a great idea. No, I, because because the Jihad versus the uh, uh, the San Diego ISIS. I don't know where where does it end. You know, I was like, <laughs> now have you been around people amongst the tribe that they just be they just turn they just become livid when they hear things like Washington Redskins, Cleveland Indians, uh, uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Um, you know, Golden State Warriors. I mean, have you been around people that have lost their mind with that? I mean, because now it's like, because now when you see, it seems when they want to change the name and they make such a, they make such a grand gesture about changing the name that you end up having people that were fans of that team 
for years. And obviously as a, you know, as a, you know, white Irish American guy, you know, yeah, I'm like, yeah, the Redskins, yeah, the Indians, yeah, the Warriors, whatever. And even for me, like the fighting Irish of Notre Dame, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, I don't know any Irish people that have gotten pissed at the fighting Irish thing. And obviously we're playing with a different set of currency. I get that. I think it definitely depends on the, the, uh, the, what what part of the currency it is? I think you know like the Florida Seminoles, the Seminole tribe is fine with it. I think red skin, you know, is kind of, kind of, it's a lot of you know uh, when you get back into scalping and, and violence, you know, Indians what they want. I think that, that to me, it's a little egregious. Indians, you know, well, it's like what would, would we be offended if we had the Cleveland Caucasians? I don't know. I mean, what, what's I, I, try, I try to look at it from different lenses, not just my own. But I, yeah, some people are pretty militant where they get super angry, but not whether they're like hostile angry. Right. Where they, where they'll put it into to artwork or protests or, or you know, they usually channel it into, you know, lead, in, into uh, actual um, activism. So I think the Cleveland Caucasians would be a great mascot. You just have just a white chick at Starbucks in her Lululemon yoga pants. <laughs> that's, your, that's your logo. But instead, when you have instead of the tomahawk chop, you have like the, uh, the, the, the tomahawk text or something. What do you do? Right. You have a phone? A... <laughs> <laughs> what is the most offensive thing to you that people do? And this can be anything. doesn't necessarily need to be derogatory towards Native Americans, but the most offensive thing to Mark Yaffe. Well, when, uh, the, probably the most awkward thing I ever had. Or it was you know, pretty offensive too, and I kind of just bit my tongue. I was on the cruise ship one time, working. Lady was, lady walks by, goes after a show. Says, "Oh, there's our Indian." Like, oh, I'm, I'm the ship mascot now. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! And I'm, I know she meant no offense. Like, are you really thinking what you're saying? Our Indian. <laughs> now, was she an older oh, lady? Yeah. Older. yeah. Yeah. So it's because like, you also get that you you almost get that hall pass. There's a certain age where people hit. Yeah. Where it's uh, if you had somebody that came by and said that to you and they were in their uh, 30s or 40s, you'd go, OK, you're really you're really a douchebag. Yeah. And and, you know, by the way, that's the, that's the first thing I'm going to say to you next time I see you is, oh, there's my Indian. <laughs> there's my Indian. <laughs> but I mean, you have that level. There's a certain age. That, uh, you know, because I go back and I remember like my grandfather and my, you know, uncles and stuff like that. And just it, it didn't matter who it was. Anybody of a certain age, they just said stuff. The Japs this, with, and watch that. And the, with no and with no edit button, no filter. And they could have cared less. And they could be talking to a, you know, a an African-American guy. And they would sling the term. They go, "Oh, you're one of my best black friends that I have." And and and, and you say, "But that was just of that of that era." Not saying that it was correct, but it was. That's all accepted. They, that's all they knew. You know, yeah. you can't. It, and it, you can't condemn ignorance in a way because if you have no, if there's no, hey, think about this for a second. No one says, "Hey, have you considered?" I was like, "What? What? Have I haven't considered. I don't know better." You know, it's like if I've been eating. You know, Cheerios my whole life, and someone told you, "Gee, you never had Frosted Flakes all these years." Like, no, oh. the one, the one that uh, cracked me up. My dad, you know, he's ninety three, so you know, talk about hall pass. He says, "Hey, so uh, the other day, he's like, uh, are they, are they still going with those uh, Black Face Matters protests?" <laughs> yeah, Dad, you're thinking of Al uh, Jolson, not Al Sharpton. Okay. <laughs> the Black Face Matters protest. Yeah. Well, come on. 90, wow. 90, I love that. My parents, 93 and 91. My parents are so old. They think Joe Biden's too young to be president. So what do you expect? You know? uh, first off, your parents are my new favorite people in the world. That absolutely cracks me up that they that they just flat out said that. That, that just makes me laugh. That just to me, like I said, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, that's just what they grew up with. And that's what they know. Oh, yeah. My, you know, and my, and, and they both, you know, they, they, been around and up and my mom like she's still under the eye oh yes uh uh we uh your your cousin your your nephew is going to be traveling to the orient <laughs> what is, 18 17 is he going to be on a steamship <laughs> traveling to the orient 
Oh my god. I like mm. that's that just absolutely that absolutely kills me. Yeah, they're awesome. My, my, now, so they're, now they're at the age where they're into half years. Like they're they recess. My dad says, "Yeah, I turned 93 and a half last week." <laughs> wow. Remember that how we used to do that when we were kids? Was yeah, when you were kids, because you couldn't wait to be the next. You couldn't wait to be seven if you were six. You're yeah. like, I'm six and a half. Yeah. And now he's he's back to that. It's awesome. I'm like, and I'm just trying, I'm trying yeah. to figure out what the age is when people don't care about saying that. You know how like our parents at a certain or you never the lady would never tell her age. And, and then they get to the blag and everything. Oh, I'm 85 and a 85 and a half when I had two bowel movements this morning. It's like they, it's like there's no filter again. Well, if you're at 85 and you have two ball movements, that's something to brag about. That's like having a Heisman trophy on your on your mantle. What uh, you got a podcast called How does that happen? Yeah. What is that? I'm fascinated with people that have have like gone after like just weird records and and done unusual activities uh so uh, I've interviewed, let's see, we had a guy trying to become the world's worst rated Uber driver in Minneapolis. Uh which included uh, during the Super Bowl, he uh, dumped a uh, it was uh, he dumped an Eagles fan about an hour a mile from his hotel, just kicked him out of the car, and he'd bring his kid in the in the Uber with him his, at the time his two year old toddler. <laughs> so, but he had other source of income, so it wasn't really a big deal. I've interviewed uh, some world competitive eating champion, uh, this lady Molly Schuyler, mother four hundred seventeen pounds, she. Eight five, over five hundred and fifty wings in thirty minutes during the uh, Super Bowl. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wait a minute, wait a minute. A female eating champion who is a hundred and seventeen pounds. Seventeen. Well, I didn't weigh her, but you know, I, I take her word for it. So what's her? So what was her secret? That's insane. I I try to eat salad. I mean, I, I literally I had a protein drink, and I got I've got a cup of coffee here now, and I'll probably you know have something reasonably <laughs> sensible for lunch. I mean, granted, I'm, you know, 6'2", I'm rocking it at about 229. I'm like, and she's 117 and eating 500 chicken wings. And she went to Texas and did the, you know, the place, the panhandle by outside Amarillo, the big steak. Right. She ate three of them. Three 72-ounce steaks. You can look this lady up. It's insane. So I like to interview people like that. And then uh, you had a comedian on there that did a thousand... A thousand, over a thousand shows, a thousand days in a row. Sammy Obeed, yeah. So he lost a girlfriend, uh, uh, illness, car breakdown. Yeah, so he, if he didn't get a paid gig, he would make sure he got on an open mic he'd, or he'd, he'd create his own gig. He had to be at a venue. It wasn't like sit in front of Zoom and pretend you're performing and go out in your backyard. So legitimate right. shows with an audience. Yeah, so that's, as we both know, that's some, some Iron Man shit right there. That is that's impressive, and that is called the uh, how how does that happen is the uh, is the podcast, that's, correct? That's it. Yep. And, and, where, they, and, where, and where can people find it at? It's on. I know you, if you go to your website, laughwithmark.com, which is spelled yeah. M A R C L A U G H, laughwithmark.com. You can uh, click on where all the uh, the podcast stuff is and all your social media platforms and stuff like that too. Yeah, and that links to my uh, dry bar special, links to the the, the uh, podcast, and. Uh, yeah, I just interviewed. Uh, what was my my? Um, my well, I'm interviewing the guy that the most frequent, the frequent flyer champion. This guy, Tom Tom uh, Steyer or Steyer, not Steyer. That's the presidential guy uh, that ran. But he, this guy, has like something like 20 million flight miles or some insanity. So I was like, as we know, I was like, and, and mostly on United. So God bless this guy. <laughs> that's like 170 million miles in any other airline. It's true. What uh, so now? What projects are you are you uh, working on right now? I know you've got the, the dry bar thing, which is which is kicking ass. I mean, obviously, we're still going through the whole pandemic right now, and hopefully, this will roll off at some at some point, so our careers can can get back to some level of uh, of normalcy. I know you're working on uh, a lot of cruise ships. Um, you know, with the with the dry bar thing, the going native special, are you looking? Are you still doing the powwow comedy jam or any version of it now? Are you still are you going to try to re resurrect that? I think we'll try to bring that back. I think there's you know, I think when this all ends, people are just going to be dying to get out and, and have some life human contact besides their kids and their significant other, you know, right? You just humans aren't made to be cooped up for this long. It's just not even, even introverts are like, oh, I gotta get the hell out of here. I'm sick of myself, you know. So, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> but I said that to myself in April. So, uh, I, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. And then I do it. I've been trying to, you know, I, I try to keep a regular writing regimen. I'm almost done. I'm, I'm working on a new hour. I'm calling this, this next, uh, uh, especially I want to call it an innocent bystander and trying to, so I'm on about 47, 45, 47 minutes. And, you know, so I've got everything there. It's going to be an hour. And then hopefully, you know, it, it looks good on paper, you know, how that is. And then zoom, you know, some zoom shows. So yeah, working on a couple of, uh, uh writing projects, doing a, uh, weekly jokes from the jacuzzi series right. so, right every uh, Sunday. Yeah, so I follow I, that on Instagram. I've seen your, uh, I've seen your clips on there, which is great. Now I was going to ask you this because, Growing up in, you know, obviously with your Native American background, was there any comedian that you watched who was Native American and you're like, oh, I can do this? Well, because I didn't know, you know, like until I met my birth mother, I didn't know about my heritage. I suspect that I, you know, people say, oh, you look kind of Native. Are you, are you Indian? I, said, I don't know. I'm adopted. So um, when I got into comedy, I heard, you know, I, I knew of Charlie Hill. So that was pretty much he's the godfather of native comedy. So right. he, wrote, he wrote for Richard Pryor. He wrote for Roseanne. He was on, uh, I guess, Letterman several times. Uh, I know at least one appearance, maybe two on Carson. So, uh, you know, to see a guy like that do it, he was ground And you talk to these guys at Comedy Store, Laugh Factory that knew him. They said pretty much he was one of the, one of the funniest comics. But this is this is a guy that was, you know, like a lot of natives, he didn't want to conform to, you know, to mainstream, you know, white man civilization. So he never had a headshot, never got a uh, website. He kind of stayed out of the box, which I think hurt his career in a way, but uh, certainly, certainly didn't hurt him on stage. But if you ever see a clip, you know, if anyone gets a chance, just Google Charlie Hill and, or watch the going native special and you see you know, this, just taking a joke and cause yeah, my, uh, 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 it's one joke is like my father took me up to uh, the mountaintop one day and said, son, look out here. Someday none of this will be yours. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. He's just, yeah, just, you know, this is one you can, uh, that's not like, but I can, you can drop some, some truth bombs and still be funny. Cause I want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to pull punches and I want it. I want people to, you know, we're, it's just, we're so just divided. I want to be able to cross a divide. I love playing red states, blue states, you know what I mean? I want to just go out there and make people laugh. And the reality is we got to, you got, you got to do it with a bit, with a bit of awareness. You know, if you, if you come at woke people too unwoke, you know, there, there's an issue. And if you come at conservative people and you just spew too much, uh, you know, wokeness at them, it is not going to work either. So it's, it's finding to me, I, I love that challenge of finding the fine line. What, what can I get away with? And, and not lose the audience. So, Well, is there any situation in the Native American community now that has brought, that has come to the forefront where you're like, I, you know what? I can't joke about that because these people will be sensitive to it. Is that even on the radar? Yeah. I mean, I like, I think definitely domestic abuse. You're not going to make, you know, white beater jokes or stuff like that. Cause that's such a, you know, a, a epidemic in Indian country, probably one, uh, Hang on, I'm, hang on, I'm taking notes. No wife beater jokes. <laughs> no wife beater t-shirt jokes will still work, so you're good on that. T-shirt's acceptable. Actual wife beating, not acceptable. Okay, cool. I'm I'm making this educational for me, too, because you know, I'm going to be back doing shows at a, uh, a Native American casino at some juncture. I want to be at least aware. Yeah. yeah. Although so, I will say this, I cannot stand the phrase woke. That just, I, you know, I don't... Uh, Ascribe yes. to that. I know. I say I do say it kind of mockingly. I'm really yeah. So it's just like a, I, 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 yeah. Now it's you know every show can become a woke quisition. I call them right. If you people taking notes, oh oh, you, you know you hot button. What what did he say wrong? It used to be people look. We're looking for the funny. Now people are looking for the offense in the in the topic. So no, they really are. It's going to be whatever word seems to trip them off. It's not you know. And I think really for the most part now, I think you're and you're seeing a a huge pendulum swing going in the other direction where people are just saying, "You know what? I'm not as a comedian. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and try to cater to your hypersensitive needs. I'm doing my I'm doing my stuff. And you know what? I may have gone this far with that joke before, but you know what? Now that I know you're going to be such a PC snowflake, I'm going to step on the accelerator and ramp it up another three or four notches. <laughs> if you're going to be such an asshole and come to a comedy show looking for a reason to be pissed off, it's like, you know, get the fuck out. Why are you here? 
you know, well, go to you know, go to Starbucks and, and and share your you know your backpack of notes that you took on you know all the uh, injustices happening in the in, in, in the world right now and, and share them with your friends over a latte listening to shitty Nora Jones music in the background. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not woke, and I don't go to Starbucks. So I'm. I'm. I'm really. Uh, I'm. I'm basically. I'm a Neanderthal. Some would say now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're dated. We're we're right about that. We're right about that age when I can walk. Listen, I can walk in and you can say, "There's my white man." Yep. And you can and you can say that. Maybe we can just get rid get by the shit and say, "Hey, I'm over fifty. You can't do anything. I'm 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 grandfathered in." <laughs> the grandfathered in comedy tour. We can just say whatever the hell we want to. Totally, totally unrelated to everything. I want you give me your favorite recipe. Oh man, what am I what am I enjoying right now? Favorite recipe? Uh is that Mark Yaffe. You we need to do a, a Mark Yaffe cooking show. Oh man. Well, you know, I I did try I did try some vegan cooking. This is, you know, so, but so, cuz if you fuck up vegan cooking, right. you, you just blame it on the fake meat. <laughs> Sorry, it tastes like honey, it must have been the taste just like lamb. Yeah. <laughs> what made you try vegan cooking? Oh, I, I I try to eat healthy. I'm, I'm actually this has been the one good thing I can say about the pandemic is I you eat very yeah. healthy. You do eat very healthy. Nah, not always. But I've really cut back on on junk food, fast food, road food. So that's good. And you know, the problem is I'm a I'm a I'm a free freak. You know, if you, if they say it's free and we're at a casino for two days and you get the buffet card and the you know the clip, I don't care if it's the the employee slop or the high end restaurant. I'm getting I'm getting everything I can. I'm eating it all. You know, so. Uh, the end of the this is the end of the buffet era. COVID has killed the buffet. COVID yeah. has killed the buffet. Listen, and then actually, I don't think there's no, anything really wrong with that because oh. how many how many buffets have you gone to where uh, there's some you know snot nosed kid doing this and then he grabs the ladle to what you were going to get? <laughs> and so I have zero problem with having plexiglass stuck up there and then you like a cafeteria style thing, tell the guy or lady behind the counter, say, Hey, I would like some chicken. I want some potatoes. And they actually spoon it on your plate and hand it to you. I am, I am way more on board with that. Now. I think if, if COVID did anything and it knocked out the concept of you just physically grabbing stuff yourself, I am all on board with that because I've seen kids like grab like a roll and then put it back. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> What if they just, how about this now? We invent a little LED screen. So you just sit there and swipe and you hit and there's a food runner. So yeah, I'll take some of this. You know, those potatoes look great. And it's this nice high, high res picture. And you just swipe and you sit at your own table. You never have to get up. Done. It goes from buffet to a, a sit fay. Exactly. A <laughs> sit fay. Right, so lack of word. Yeah. So your favorite recipe? Personally to eat or to cook? To cook. Oh, to cook. Uh, my go-to right now would probably be zucchini shrimp noodles. You spiralize the zucchini, you lather it in butter, garlic it up, uh, and, and stir fry some some shrimp up. Oh, a ton of Parmesan cheese. Yeah. To, yeah What's so. your uh, so your so your, so your secret seasoning in that is going to be your uh, is going to be the garlic and the Parmesan cheese. Yeah. And you know, I'm trying. I love pasta, but I'm trying to cut down on pasta, so I got into the zucchini noodles. So you know, I got the little spiralizer thing, and it you know, it took a minute, but now I'm like, yeah, I can eat that anytime. Yeah. So now, but next then, time we get together, can we just get? We'll just have zucchini noodles and whiskey. Does the whiskey go on on blended in the noodles? Or are we gonna just? Uh, no, we just don't. we're just gonna get hammered, and uh, and we're gonna eat all of your crappy vegan recipes that you tried to make that you screwed up. Yeah, we can always just dip the shrimp in a little whiskey. Wow. Oh, it's not. It's not vegan. It's got shrimp. It's got like <laughs> got a crustacean in it, and it's delicious, dude. Always great to see you. Your special mid laugh crisis is a riot. I highly recommend anybody check it out on Dry Bar, which you can go right to your website laughwithmark.com and click on it and get the Dry Bar special, or you can go to the Dry Bar app and pull up uh, mid laugh crisis. Also, uh, going native too. The special that's on Showtime that you can now get on Amazon Prime. Go ahead and uh, and click on that and see. Mark Yaffe, whenever he comes back to your town, my friend, always good to see you, bud. Hey, thanks, buddy. Congratulations on your dry bar and uh, continued success with the show. 
Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it, brother. Thanks for listening to A Drink with Derek. Find out when Derek is appearing near you by checking out DerekRichards.com. See you next time for A Drink with Derek.